prayer, and that's what we're going to kind of do this morning. <clears throat> One thing that I think is necessary, because um, Daniel now is praying for his people, the Jewish people, and Jeremiah 31, verses uh, 45, uh, 35 and 36, is a passage of scripture that um, where God promises that Israel, and I think I probably <coughs> ought to stick that up there, this is where it's at, 31, uh, chapter 31, 35 through 36. Thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light, but listen to this, by day. One day when I was in the sanctuary upstairs teaching, one of the adults that was in that class at that time, no longer here, but he spoke up and he said, how long will the Jews last? He said, are they temporary? Uh, uh, we know that you know they're being, so to speak, uh, discriminated against all over the world with all that's going on. Uh, how, will, will they finally become not a nation? Listen to this. Thus saith the Lord which giveth the sun for a light by day, still shining, and the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, still active, which divides the sea when the waves thereof roar. And you know the story of how the, the, the elements, the sun and the moon, takes care of the ocean. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, if the ocean, if the stars, if the moon, if everything loses its significance in this world, he says, said the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So Sunday this puts it to you straight and first forward. No such thing as pushing the land of Israel off into the Mediterranean Sea. It's not going to happen. No such thing as the Palestinians and the and the Muslims and so forth there. They just totally wanting to annihilate the Jewish nation. It'll never happen. Why? Because God said it would. That's, that's how you know. It'll always exist as a nation. I thought we need to put that in because this is Jewish teaching here that we're going into in this chapter. Okay. <coughs> Many Bible teachers believe that this chapter is the backbone of prophecy. It's what holds all prophetic teachings together, this chapter. So it's very important that we understand that. And of course, King Darius is the king now. And, um, and you see it's about uh, 537, 538 B.C. before Christ. The same year Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. So you see again that these chapters are not in chronological order. You know, we've already been through Daniel and the lion's den. But it happened about the same time. He's about 80 years old, maybe 80 plus. Israel's been in captivity for 67 years at the time of this writing. And he's reading prophecy recorded in Jeremiah 25, 11, and in chapter 12, 29, uh, 11 and 12, rather, it's verse 11 and 12, 25, 11 and 12. I've got it circled wrong in my, on my sheet. And the next uh, uh, chapter that he is looking at in Jeremiah is 29 and 10. So he is... He has been reading the scripture. Now let's read a little bit in this chapter before we go on further in our notes and on PowerPoint. <coughs> in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed, which means the offspring of the Medes, uh, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years Whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. I want you to mark the word of the Lord. Because this, this prayer, this prayer that has stood withstood the, the test of times, is based entirely on praying the word of God. That's what he's doing as you go through this chapter. I want you to keep that in mind. Because he is looking now, he said... He said, um, I Daniel understood because I looked back at the books. What was he looking at? We'll look at it in a minute here on PowerPoint. But he was looking at the scriptures in Jeremiah. And he was saying, he's seeing what God said, and he is bringing that into his prayer as promise from God. You know, the easiest thing in the world to do with prayer is to get in a rut. And, and pray that, you know what I'm saying? Just say the same things. Uh, some prayer, people's prayers are so predictable you can pray them with them if you know what I'm talking about. My daddy, 
that one of his favorite phrases in his prayers when our all the, the, the grandchildren say, come on. I remember granddad saying that. He'd say, and bless all who duty bounds us to pray for. That was in his prayer. <laughs> that just captivated the whole thing. He didn't have to go into detail. Just bless them all, Lord. But he always said that. And it's, and it's amazing how sometimes our prayers get to be repetitive. And, and if God did answer them, and I've often said, we'll say, Lord, bless them. Well, how would you know if God answered that prayer? What is he going to have to do to bless them? What does he do when he blesses people? You know, we're so vague in the way we pray sometimes. And Daniel teaches us something about prayer here that I need to get a hold of, and I hope you will as we move forward. So here he is now, and he's going to the book of Jeremiah the prophet, and uh, he's saying here that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. I've set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications. What's supplications? What's the difference in prayer and supplications? If I if I uh, remember from, especially from the, uh, Philippians chapter four, that's how we're supposed to, you know, where he says, "Be not anxious for anything." Uh, that's my interpretation of that scripture. He said, "But all things by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to the Lord." What is supplications? It's begging the Lord. It's getting down to business and saying that. I mean, I've seen times in my life when I prayed, and I prayed and prayed, and all of a sudden it's just like, I think, man, I've got to have this, Lord. I, you've got to do this for me. And it was, a, and, and then there was just a poor urgency. Uh, you know, that's the kind of prayer supplications are, and this is what Daniel was doing here. And he not only did that, but he did it with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love them and to them that keep His commandments. And we have sinned. Notice this, verse 5. And committed iniquity. We've done wickedly. We've rebelled even by departing from the precepts and from my judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto the service of prophets that spake in your name to the kings, our princes and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Let's stop there. And look at this. So here he is. And he starts telling us that he had set his face. To, what do you do when you set your face to, fix, to seek the Lord? How do you set your face to seek the Lord? Put your mind on him. Do away with everything else. It's first priority, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's just like above everything else. No matter nothing else. I mean, first thing i got to do is get a hold of it. I want, him, I want his face. I want his face on me. I want my face on him. Yeah. It's, it's, it's urgency. It's seeking his face. And that's what he says. And he does it with prayer and supplications, begging the Lord. He fasts and he puts on sackcloth and ashes. So here he is in total, total uh, depriving and denying himself. Uh, he's alone with God and he's taking God in his word. Let's see what happens to him. So, he goes on from there, and let's move on to the next one because I think I give you that scripture there, and I just read that one, so I won't go back and reread it. This is what he was reading, and this is Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12 that's recorded there in the first part of your notes. It says, And while this land, whole land, <clears throat> shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations, now he's talking about the land of Israel, he's talking about that Jeremiah here is talking about the land of Israel being a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now this was Jeremiah the prophet. He's known as the weeping prophet. Mm -hmm. And it shall come to pass that 70 years, that when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make perpetual desolations. One of these, that I don't know if we'll ever get to it or not, but let me tell you something, that's what happened about And here he is, he's reading from Jeremiah, and he's reading the promises of God. Now watch you, as he moves from there to the next one, and this is 29 and 10, and that's the, the, the also recorded there on your study guide. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word to you, toward you, in causing you to return to this place, which was their home, the land of Israel. And he's saying, 
Okay, now Daniel is 67 years into captivity. Remember, he was just a kid when he was, he was, he was captured and taken, and they were all taken away to Babylon. And now he, he's coming to the end of it. It's, it like, he, he knows there's probably about three years, as best people can calculate, until the 70 years will be up. Well, God has promised in both of these passages of Scripture that when it happens, He says, I'll cause you to return to this place. Where was they going to return to? To their home. Yeah. You're going home, buddy. You're heading home. And this is what He's telling God. And they are and Daniel here is praying this scripture. And I thought, what kind of significance does it have for us? And I, I you know, so he as he as he as he he and look what he says. He says that the people are praying. Let me go back to this. The whole land he says they'll that they pray. That, and uh, let me move on. I <clears> know <throat> I don't need that one yet. Okay, they're praying. And uh, he said, he said, I'm causing, I want to cause you to return to this place. So, here he is, and he's going over these promises of God, and he knows this. And the key to getting God to move and to activate what God has planned for these people is, is when the people pray. Do you see that in these scriptures? They're to, they're to pray. And, and were they praying? Was, was all of these... Captive, captives uh, that had gone from been taken from the land of Judah to Babylon and been there almost sixty, well, almost seventy years now. Were they praying? No. Not that I could find. Mm -hmm. Nobody but Daniel is praying. Mm -hmm. And so I asked myself a question. I thought they're not praying. And then it hit me: Are our families praying now? Yes. No. Right. Some are. Are your families praying now? Do they know the value of really getting hold of God Almighty because of faith in His Word and confidence that He hears when we pray? Is that where your family is? Mine's not. Mine's not. They all know the value of prayer. They've seen miracles time and time again in our home and our lives. And, and I tell them many times about things that God's done. And They know, but are they praying? No. Okay, what can we do about it? This is what God said to me this week. What can we learn from his prayer? What he's doing is intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is here's God. This is lots of things it says that. Here's a, here's your child, or here's your children, or here's the world. And what you're doing is standing in between them yeah. and bringing it together. Yeah. Bringing it together. Say, hard work. You can. Go ahead, what you say? I said that's hard work. It is hard work, but intercessory prayer it, is available. You've got to have it. You have to do it. Now look at this. Uh, because he says here, he says, he goes on to that. Let me go down to this. I'm, I, let's just follow your sheep for a minute. 319, through 319, there's many verses there. What can we learn from the way he prayed for these people of his? What can we learn from this intercessory prayer? Well, he set his face. We've already talked about that. Or he focused on his personal God. And I think it's interesting that he that he his God here is he named he Lord. See in verse four, Lord. He calls the Lord. I pray unto the Lord my God. The word Lord, I think I put that here somewhere I might find it. <coughs> Let's see. Let's see what I got here. I pray to and, and what the word Lord means Yahweh. It means my personal God. It's not a God far away that Daniel knew, or that John the Baptist knew, or that Apostle Paul knew. It's my God. It's Yahweh. And he says, I did not, I, this is him going between him and his people. His people, what were they doing? You know, where were they at this time? They weren't praying. We don't know where they were. The Bible doesn't tell us as far as all of the captives that were there. But we do know one thing. Daniel had to get a hold of God for his people. And here he is. And so he set his face on Yahweh. And Yahweh is the covenant keeping God. He is the God who keeps covenant. Yeah. To a thousand generations, He is the God who keeps covenant. I think it's interesting, and I, I don't know, I, I, I wish I had time to go back, but I'll never get through this, this chapter if I do, but go to the 15th chapter of Genesis and look at the covenant that God made with Abraham. Because that scripture will teach you what true covenant and, and cutting, it's called cutting a covenant, is all about. 
It was a picture of Abraham, and God had told him, he says, you're going to have a son. Through that son, through your, through your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. He's old. He don't, he, he, he's probably, and in fact, he goes to the Lord in the 15th chapter of Genesis, the first few verses, and he says, why can't you just let my Eliezer, my, my, my servant, be my seed? Why don't, why don't you, you know, don't you know, he was just giving up on the fact that they, he and Sarah would ever have a child. And he didn't understand how God was going to bring that to pass. And so he leads God out there, and God and Abraham are together. And they're always, when they cut a covenant, they were in a ditch. They was in a place where it was a ravine. It was like down in a hole, so to speak. And what they would do is take animals, and they would cut them down the middle like we did a hog. You remember how we raised hogs? All of us have probably seen that done or done it. And they would have to drain the blood out of it, right? So... I remember when Daddy, I thought we was rich when Daddy finally got to where he had a chain fall in his old garage and he'd hang the, cop, the hog on the chain fall. And I thought that was so wonderful. <laughs> because he would, he would bleed out there. But the blood had to come out of the animals. The blood would go into a ditch down at the, the bottom of the ravine. <coughs> and so God and Abraham's in this place. And, uh, and uh, he's saying, D -d -d just let my servant be my seed. And God says, no. And he goes out and he says, I'm going to, and he makes a covenant with Abraham. And uh, he said, I told you that through you all the nations of the world is going to be blessed. And Abraham stops. And I, I'm just like, I'm sure I would if you would. What if somebody told you you was going to have a baby at your age? I'd have a dying duck fit, wouldn't you? I'd think, oh, no, 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 and so God says, and what they did was, when, they, when the blood all went down into the ditch at the bottom of the ravine, what they did was both people, parties, would walk through that ditch, walk through that blood, and it was called cutting a covenant with blood. That's the way they cut covenant. Well, what happened to Abraham is unbelievable. He's shaking in his boots. He's scared to slap down to death. He knows he can't make it happen. And so, and God knows he knows. And it's so amazing because... The light comes on, the darkness comes, hides it, and he looks, and God's walking through that blood. God says, you don't have to keep the covenant, but I will. God is a covenant-keeping God. This is the God that Daniel knew when he was praying. And he says, let me tell you something. He's a great and he's a dreadful God. I pray unto him, and I make confession, which means I think he was confessing his own negligence or his own sins or whatever that. Probably the confession of the people because it was intercessory prayer. And said, Oh great and dreadful God who keeps covenant. And he knew about this covenant process and loving kindness to those who love him and keep his commandments. God, the Lord, his personal God. It's not personal to you. Yeah. I tell you. I tell you. Sometimes he's so he's close you can almost feel him breathing. Yeah. He is personal. And this is what Daniel was experiencing here. So I turned to the Lord and I pled with him in prayer and fasting. If you want to know about fasting, we don't have time to get into it, but Isaiah 58 is the chapter, the biblical chapter on fasting. It, called, it talks about God himself calling for a fast. And uh, uh, if it, God calls the fast, it'll work and tells you how to do it. And also Jesus spoke of, of fasting in uh, Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18, and tells us how to fast. This so Isaiah what? Isaiah chapter 58 is the chapter, the biblical chapter on fasting. That's when Isaiah tells you how to fast. It's fasting instructions. <clears throat> okay, so here he comes with his people in this kind of fix, and he comes with fasting, and he's pleading with God, and this is what's amazing. He's confessing the sins of his people. Do you see that? Look at him here. He says, he, he says in uh, verse 5, For we've sinned, and we've committed iniquity, done wickedly, rebelled, even in departing from the precepts of our precepts and judgments. Neither have we hearkened to the servants of prophets, which spake in the name of our kings and princes and fathers, and all the people of the land. Oh, Lord, he says. It's like he's saying, this is what we've done. Okay, I want to ask you a question. Can we, as believers today, in our century, in our, just before the Lord's coming, he confessed the sins of his people in that verse of scripture, did he not? He's going between them. Can we do this? All right, move that on. There's a scripture that I want to show you. I think the next slide. 
Timothy told us, can we do that? What if your children and my children and my family and your family is not serving God? And you need to make intercession for them. You need to, God's here and they're there, and you need to pull them together and by prayer. And, and, and so many times God leads you to fast. The sackcloth was a, a way of, of uh, expressing his humility. They did that many times in the Old Testament. Job especially did it. And he says, so he confessed the sins of his people. Can I do it? Look what he said. 1 Timothy 2, 1. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Can you do it? Yeah. Can you do it according to the Scripture? Can you confess the sins of your, your, your children? Of your, oh, man, I tell you. And it go to 1 John 5 and 16. Do we have that one down there, John? I'm going to let you do that now because I get this <laughs> when I do two things at once. All right, this is what Daniel says in 9 and 5. He says, we've sinned, we've done wrong, we've been wicked, we've rebelled, we've turned away from your commandments and laws. And the question is, it is. And this is what 1 John 5, 16 says. This is a phenomenal scripture to me. If, you, if any man see a brother, which means a fellow believer, somebody's been born into the family of God, sinning in a way that does not lead to death, in other words, God don't kill him, and God sometimes kills people for sin. Is that not true? That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You'll find scripture there where God literally cuts, us, cuts people off sometimes in order for them to be saved. And that happens. We won't get into that today. But if you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, or God doesn't kill him, God doesn't take him out of here prematurely, I believe many a person leaves this world prematurely because they won't repent. But the scripture says... God will give that person life. <laughs> I love this. I love this. That I can pray for my loved ones. And if they've been saved, even though they're... Uh, do y'all have people in your family that even they say they're saved, I'm ready. I'm, I, I've, I've said that many. I'm ready, I know. I met my little old grandson, oldest grandson, one day not long ago in the Sam's. And, and I said, Brandon, I've got to know. I've hammered him so many times. I've got to know. Do you know that you're ready to meet the Lord? He said, Mama, don't you remember when I've done that? And he went back and told me when he was a little boy, when he was saved. But this is it. He's saved. But is he? Is he living? Is he see, living in sin? Yep. 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 Y'all know what I'm talking about. People in your life, and they, 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 oh, well, yeah, I don't need what you've got. I'm saved. I'm ready. And yet their life is not producing fruits of righteousness. Okay, look at this. We've got to go on. This Daniel's got so much to say to us here. All right, Daniel 9, 16 through 19. This is how he prayed. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations. Oh, I think he saw such desperate needs in the people. And the city that's called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness. <laughs> Nothing good in us, is it? But Jesus, but the cause of our, your great mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. Oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. But he wasn't he down to business praying. Man, talk about a prayer. What was he doing? He's praying the Word. And that's how you pray. That's how we all pray. Get his promises and pray them. Okay, let's move forward now and see what happens. <clears throat> he, he asked God to grant this request. And here's the scripture. Oh, I wanted to share something with you before we turn to the back of the page. We've got to get into this prophecy thing. I think this is so interesting. I don't know who done this because no, nobody was given uh, accreditation for it. But I read it in one of the books that helps me to get this together for you. It said, someone once recited Daniel's prayer in the Hebrew language. Now, you know that was Old Testament. And it timed at about three minutes. Or he could pray that the person who was doing this, repeating this same prayer that they, in the Hebrew language that Daniel was praying. That means it took Gabriel, because great Gabriel's fixing to come and meet Daniel, about three minutes to get from the throne of God to Daniel's residence in Babylon. Is that not sweet? No wonder Daniel said Gregor had been caused to, to, to fly swiftly, and you'll find that in verse 21. 
So, we change the world by praying God's Word. Uh, there's a scripture. He's praying the Word of God. Uh, if my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Why are we not seeing prayers answered like that? We know so many things are His will. It's definitely His will for people to be saved. He said, I'm not willing that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we know it's His will to save people. He said, you ask what you will and it shall be done. Do you think it could be we're short on the words about this? I think we don't. We don't. It's like, it's like if, uh, I, I remember when I worked and we traveled a lot. And uh, we'd go into these motels and I, I'm sure it does that way probably and even worse now. But we always had a, 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 either a code or a card we could slip into the door to get in. It's like God is saying in John 15, 7, here's your card. Here's your code. This is how you get in. This is how you get answers to your prayer. He's telling you. Daniel is talking and praying the Word of God here. So we can just stay on that. But does that help you? Does it help you to start praying for the people that are not, not living as you think that they should? Or you know that they're not living like they should. Most of the time we know, don't we? You can't say it. Say that. Then you're not going to come across as critical or demanding. You can't make them. And I'll tell you one thing, you can get on your face before God and you can get a hold of God and get a hold of that person and bring them to God. And it's biblical. Okay. All right, here's Gabriel. Let's move on. And uh, in 21, so he finishes praying, verse 20. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountains of my, mountain of my God, how he, he was praying for his own land, he's praying for his own people. And while I was speaking and praying in, in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly, fly swiftly, and according to this guy, in three minutes he was there, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. That was about three o'clock in the evening. They had an oblation at nine o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the evening for the Jews. And he said, uh, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give you all skill and understanding. Okay, let's move on and look at this next slide here. Okay, no, move back. Go back. I'm afraid I'll get you mixed up because we've got to go through this sheet first. <laughs> sorry, sorry, John. I do those PowerPoints and can't remember how, how far I went. Okay, now let's look at what he's going to tell him. This, this angel is fixing to tell him. Same angel, same angel that came to Mary and the mother of Jesus that came to Zacharias, the, mother, the father of John the Baptist. Here is Gabriel. And he is literally, according to the scripture, an archangel. He's a man of God or a warrior of God. That's how he's identified in the scripture. And he's got a message for him. And he sent Daniel an answer about Israel's past. Did he? Nope. He does not even talk to him about his past. I love this. Look at that. As he moves down through here. He said at the, let's read the, Let's read 22. And, I, and, and he informed me, Daniel informed me, and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I now come, for, come forth to give thee skill and understanding. He said, At the beginning of thy supplication, or when you started begging God, using the Word of God, the commandment came forth, and I'm come to show you, or to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So now he's fixing that. Does he even mention the past? No. He said, I'm going to show you what's about to happen. And so I tried to make a little uh, uh, simple, hopefully simple. Look at your sheet now. All right, he doesn't go back and we talk about the people. He goes forward. He said, this is what's about to happen. Daniel. He said, this is, and he gives him literally the future, and this is what this whole last part of this chapter from verses 20. 4 through 27 especially, it's what it's about is the history of Israel and the future that is to come. So, he, he, he and look, if you'll follow the little uh, diagram that I tried to put together here. Daniel asked God about the past. Now, he had really done that in his prayer. And God answered Daniel about the future. So, this is the three things that, that this scripture is all about. And uh, I'm going to go back down and read that in a minute, but I want to show you something. He, he, that's because I think you need to read with me. In verse 24, let's see if we can go back there. Go back up. Uh, okay, you're okay. Just stay on the, stay there. 
He says, there's 70 weeks that are determined upon thy people, the Jews, and upon the holy city, Jerusalem. And these are the six things that God's going to do. He's going to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, bring an everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision of prophecy, and anoint the most holy. So here he is, and these are the six things that he mentions. And he says it's going to take 70 weeks. Well, these weeks are not seven days, as you'll see. Know therefore and understand, he says in verse 25, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. All right, look at your diagram. So he said, and what he's talking about here is weeks of years. He's talking about not seven days, but weeks of years. So he's saying 70 times 7. And, and if you read down in Daniel's day, he's telling you kind of what, ha what happened in Daniel's day. In 2 Chronicles 37, 27, 26, I'm sorry, and 21, you'll find a passage of scripture there that tells you uh, that the Jews were supposed to let the red land rest. Mm -hmm. The crops, they couldn't grow crops every seven years. And they did not mind. They didn't do what God said. They grew crop crops anyway. And that's why that's what this first thing is, is talking about here. He says, let's read 70 times 7. He said, the sabbatical years were violated. I told, I told the people of Israel, you can grow crops, but every seventh year, you are to let the land rest. Well, they didn't do it. And so that's the, he, that was the past part. And that's what he, he, and Daniel asked God about the past, and that's what he said. He said, that's why you would, that's really the reason why they were captured and they carried away to Babylon, is because they defied at God and did not keep that law. And then he says the second part of the law, <clears throat> the second part of the vision, is the seven years of, 70 years of captivity. We read both of those scriptures in Jeremiah there at the bottom. So that was the second part of it. Now, the third part of it is years remaining. And I wanted you to kind of get this in your head. So he's telling you, that, okay, they violated God's law, ended up in Babylon 70 years in captivity. And he says, and he wasn't talking about seven days, seven days a week, but he's talking about seven weeks of years. And uh, he says this. <clears throat> uh, and then, of course, the, there is 70 week, seven, seven, 70 decreed years remaining. In 24 through 27. <coughs> I talked yesterday online. <coughs> I had this same problem in my voice. I don't know what's going on. I need prayer. <laughs> Not sick, must be allergies. But anyhow, okay, I want to show you something. <coughs> I had this, I drew this out, and I think it'll make it clearer to you if you can see it. Can y'all see it? Anybody see it? <coughs> This is the 70 weeks that are determined upon God's people, the Jews, and the Holy City. And this is these verses, 24 through 27. So 70 weeks of years is 40, 490 years. 70 weeks of years. And this is Daniel, and he's telling you here, he said, that, he said we, this is, he, as he goes through, and I'm not going to go through all these dates, but this is Calvary. And he says, there's 70 times 7, and in the middle, and you've got one week that's still left, and he, he talks about the Messiah, the Prince, which is the Lord Jesus being born. And then he goes to Calvary. Then there's, a, and I just want to give you this broad overview, you can look at this later. But then there's a great interval. There's a time when uh, it's, it's what would happen between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel, we're not told. But the crazy part is this it's like God reactivates his promise. And you've got one week, which is a tribulation period. So you've got what they did not by not remembering God's laws. You've got the, the birth of Jesus. You've got his life and him being cut off and crucified. And then you've got an interval that don't tell us. And then you've got the tribulation. That's kind of what this is saying. It's so complicated. Lord have mercy. I tell you, I have scanned <coughs> material for weeks trying to figure out what this means. And I don't know if there's two people in the whole wide world but at least it means the same thing. But let's read it. I kind of summarize it this way in this bottom paragraph. Oh my, we gotta go. How long 70 weeks? It was 70 times 7, 490 years. And let me go down through here. He said, um, he said, uh, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem 
and that, that we read, we will read about that in the book of uh, Jeremiah, until my, my, my son, the prince, there shall be seven weeks, or 49 years, and 62 weeks, 334 years. And that's verse 25. Messiah, the Jewish prince, the anointed one, the ruler will be cut off. He'll be crucified at 62 weeks. And then God will give the Jews another seven years during the tribulation period when he'll deal directly with them. So that's clear as mud. I know that the purpose of it is to finish the transgression, make an end of sin, make atonement for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and anoint the blessed total place. What they're saying is you're going home. <laughs> Jesus is going to be born. And he's, he's and when he's 33 years old, he's going to be crucified. He's going to be cut off. The prince is going to be cut off. But I'm telling you here, it's not going to be for himself. It's for you and me. Do you see that, that first that, that, that brings in the, the time of the Gentiles. Right? If we're fixing to go into the Gentiles now, yeah. <coughs> right. And, and uh, then the, the 70th week is going back to, back to the Jews. The mm -hmm. Jews. Mm -hmm. Because you see, the tribulation is, is, is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time when God brings them through a melting pot, the Jewish nation, uh, and he brings the tribulation. And that, that is that 70th week. But 69 weeks, you see what happens here. He says it's going to be trouble sometimes. The wall is going to be built again. What that means is you're going back to Jerusalem. That's, and now if you're following what's going on in the news, uh, we are in the process, as best I can determine from people that I read after, that the temple that has not been in Jerusalem since Titus destroyed it in AD 70 is either in process of being, uh, it's on the table, so to speak. And I've heard all kinds of things. They've laid the cornerstone. I've heard it's being rebuilt. All I know is <coughs> it's going to be rebuilt. There's four temples in the Bible, and this one will be the Antichrist temple. It'll, they think it, the Jews think it's they're building it for themselves. But they are gone, they have gone home. God said, I'll hiss and they'll come from all over the world. You know what word hiss means? Yeah. Whistle. 